Ad measurement has a critical role to play in media buying optimization and planning. The competition in the ad measurement space, particularly video ad measurement, is continuously increasing. And with the increase in competition, it's also highly likely that the digital advertising industry is going to achieve its goal of a cross-screen solution. However, despite the developments, there are challenges that industries face with regards to ad measurement and how we address them. Consider this, the number of US advertisers who are satisfied with the different types of ad measurement is not even more than 50%. When it comes to digital video ad measurement solutions, only 38% of US advertisers are satisfied with the results. Now, to me, these stats depict a snapshot of the challenges that advertisers face in acquiring common standards to measure ad performance effectively. Perhaps they need to stop compromising on the measurement of advertising campaigns and instead use it to drive their businesses. Our guest today will hopefully share some light on this challenge and how we can solve it. Hello, and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast, brought to you by Sproutworth.com. I'm Renee Koshi, and our guest today is Jeff Greenfield. Jeff, you are the CEO at Provalytics. You're actually an entrepreneur with three decades of strategy, growth, and marketing experience, building and leading teams with an emphasis on innovative marketing enabled by new technology. Prior to co-founding Provalytics to build the next generation of attribution, you led by-site strategy, sales, and development at Wide Orbit. And prior to that, you were the CEO and co-founder of C3 Metrics, a leading multi-touch attribution platform with clients including the likes of JP Morgan, US Bank, and a fair few others that I could go on about. But your technical innovations include real-time digital viewability measurement, integrated linear, and OT television measurement and the creation of a cookie-less identifier. Now you've spoken in a number of different conferences, your This Is Attribution podcast and attribution certificate for certification program. And you've grown your team to 55 with a 171% year over year growth, leading the company at the time to be named as the Moix 2018 Technology Fast 500. A very impressive resume, Jeff, but I'm curious because you started out in majoring in the health science and were a chiropractor for a time. So how on earth did you get to start Provalytics? That's a great question. And I don't know that we have five hours to go into <laughs> all of it, but the reality is that all about when a challenge comes up, it's how we address it and what we do to move forward. And actually, even before being a chiropractor, the way I paid my way through grad school and college is that I was a magician wow. and, uh, and I specialized in close-up magic. So I used my hand. So when I had an opportunity to go to grad school and I thought about the health sciences, which I really liked, chiropractic made sense because it used the hands. And I thought that was it for me. I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. And then I got involved in an injury. I injured a nerve in my arm from a car accident. And so I was taken out of that career. And that was right around the time of the mid nineties and the birth of the internet. And so I found myself working in the digital space and moving towards there and eventually started managing some media for clients. And then this question came up of how do you tell who actually won the conversion? And it used to be easy before digital. It was very simple because it was either TV, print or radio, really easy. But when digital came around, everything seemed to be deterministic because there were all these clicks. And what I found with this one client is that for every single conversion event, there were like four or five people raising their hands saying, I was the one responsible for that. Oh, no, it was me. It was me. <laughs> and for clients that had CPA deals, they were sometimes paying out five to six times for every conversion event. Mm. And that led me towards this path of saying, OK, there's got to be a single source of truth here. And that led me down this rabbit hole, if you will, of measurement. And that started the development of C3 metrics and built that up. And then I thought I was done in 2019. I thought I'm all set with measurement. And then about a year and a half or so ago, I decided to take a look back. And I saw that there was this disruption going on in the space. And as a result, everyone was going backwards. And what's happened now is that we have a whole generation of marketers who are used to looking at Google Analytics as the source of truth. But the problem is that we all know that things like, especially in the B2B space, events, work out really well. 
podcasts like this, they work out really well. And I don't know about you, but the last time I looked in Google Analytics and even in GA4, there's no tab for podcast or events. They don't show up in there. And there's great success stories of B2B companies, even advertising on linear television and definitely CTV. And there's no space for that in Google Analytics because GA is all click-based. And so now we're facing this world where there's a lot of places to get the word out to build awareness. And those are impressions that are in market, but there's no direct click activity. So how do you appropriate that? And that's what drew me back is hmm. that we're dealing with this kind of upheaval, if you will, in the world of measurement. And it's pretty exciting to me. This type hmm. of stuff is sexy. It really is. <laughs> we'll unpack that a little bit, but I'm also curious, given your journey to date, what would you say would be your area, personal area of strength? My personal area of strength is that I always challenge myself every week. Every single week, I play around with new things. Like I'm always on Product Hunt, that new site that's out that always has. And Product Hunt is all about trying to find, very rarely do you find something that's brand new. Essentially, it's entrepreneurs that are, have tried to recreate something, but they're doing it a little bit better. So I'm always there. I'm always challenging myself to try out a new tool, integrate a new technique do something a little bit different. So for me, over the last month and a half, two months, it's been like, okay, I'm going to really double down on my content game because content is key when it comes to B2B, especially fresh content. And that's a lot of work because you've got to sit down and think about what content are you going to put out? And then also consistently putting out a newsletter. And that's just, it's just time. And it really comes down to time management and scheduling. But for me, I'm always about challenging myself every week to learn something new, add in a new skill so that I'm always ahead. And but you're never really ahead when it comes to technology. There's always <laughs> new stuff that's going to that's going to kick you in the behind. So the key is as long as you're always challenging yourself, you'll be in great shape. Right. And in that area of strength, what would you say is something that businesses don't know? But sure. I'll focus in, I'll hone in on that question in terms of B2B. The one thing that I see consistently across with B2B, and this is not just large enterprise with thousands of employees, even small startups. The B2B process is very involved and it's always a longer journey than anyone anticipates in terms of the B2B uh, purchase process. And what ends up happening is that Someone gets excited at a company about some new service or product, and they go and they check it out, and they're really excited about it, and they want to bring it internally. And then they have a moment of clarity where they say, well, is there something here that could get me fired? So then they go and they do a little bit of sanity check. They go and they Google the company. They go to LinkedIn. They go to social media. And what companies don't know is that their message across all of these different places has to be consistent. And I see so many times that what people say about themselves on their website is completely different than what they say on Twitter, completely different on LinkedIn, completely different on Facebook, and completely different in articles they're putting out. And what that does is there's nobody that's saying, oh my God, they're so different. But what it does is for the person who's excited about bringing this internally, their little spidey sense goes off, the hairs on the back of their neck goes up and they say, oh, maybe I shouldn't bring this inside. Something is telling me that something's wrong there. So what businesses don't know is they need to have a consistent message across every place where they're out. And even their, and really basic is their press releases. Look at press releases for some large B2B enterprise companies, even over the course of a year, the little the bottom part that says who they are changes with every single press release, and it's completely different than what they say elsewhere. And that just makes people feel very uncomfortable. So companies need to decide who and what they are and stay on message is really what it is. It's very interesting you say that because there have been a lot of conversations that I've listened into where it's all about the numbers. If you can measure it, you can measure it and use the data to drive your business forward. Everything else gets put to the side. But listening to you, the idea of messaging and branding seems to be your key focus, if I could put it that way, in terms of developing a company. And it makes sense to me in that you've got the same message being put 
out across different channels, and then you can measure the effectiveness of how people engage across different channels and build out your strategies. Does that be your way of thinking as well? Yeah, and I think to add on to that, I think where a lot of B2B companies make a mistake is that they think that B2B marketing is so different than B2C marketing. The reality is that, okay, I'm marketing to a company, I'm selling into an organization, account-based marketing, all of the techniques, great. And then I find someone who's excited about it and they tell other people at work about it. But when all these folks come home at night, they're consumers and they still think like consumers. And so you have to think from a B2B perspective that you are B2B, but you're also B to C to B to B. It's a very involved journey. And the way to build, since it's such a long journey, you're trying to build trust along that process. And the way to do that is to elevate your brand. So when you're B2B folks are at home at night and they happen to be watching a game or they're watching a TV show or they're watching the news and they see that you're sponsoring it, it elevates you up. And that's where that branding comes in. And there's tons of research to show that branding pays off on a, a, on a tremendous basis. In fact, all B2B companies, we all know the value of having and of being at an event, having a whole team there, having a presence there. That's branding. That's the same as having big TV add on if you could during the Super Bowl. So branding and understanding that the sales process is somewhat emotional. You have to invoke emotion. You have to get people excited, but you also have to build trust. And that comes with the consistency over time and the consistent messaging as well. Would you say that a purpose-driven brand is ultimately what companies should strive for. I think purpose-driven brands are somewhat the rage, are as are sustainable brands. I think you just have to decide who you are and what it is that you're selling and understand that when you're trying to get your message out there, it has to be as simple as a consumer brand. If you can't figure out what it is that you're selling and come up with a very simple pitch that someone could get within five or six seconds, then you have to go back to the drawing board. I think being purpose-driven is wonderful if, that's, if there is a purpose behind it that's altruistic, that's for the environment. I think those things are great. But I think where most B2B companies fall down is they haven't figured out, they haven't defined really who and what they are. Going back to the whole seven snick thing of discovering your why. Exactly. That's really what it is. And, yeah. and that's a very tough thing to figure out. And, it reminds me here in the States, there was a very popular show on called Project Run, where they brought in these designers and these designers would come in and they would have a certain time frame, and they would have like limited materials and they would have to make a dress or an outfit or something. And it'd have to be designed around some sort of theme. And Tim Gunn was the co-host and Tim would come in and he would help them and give them guidance. And his number one advice whenever he would step back and look at an outfit was that they needed to edit. And that's what I find across the board is that B2B brands need to edit what their message is. They need to subtract versus add. Whereas most folks tend to think we just need to add more stuff. And again, the old adage is true. Less is always more. Mm. Certainly. And you make a great point there. Curious, with this idea of improving our brand message and resonance with the message, as, as well as looking at conversions, there's a few issues that come to mind. First of, of course, there are so many different platforms, and many of which provide varying levels of access or trackability, if I could use that word, and your platform helps to solve a lot of that. But perhaps more fundamentally, a lot of companies use revenue as their North Star metric. Is that sufficient in terms of not just making sure that they're profitable and growing, but looking at the overall resonance, or do we need to take a more of a longer term approach of understanding the whole customer journey where each bit of messaging fits into each of those parts of the journey and construct more of a holistic picture? You really hit on something really important there because it needs to be holistic. At the end of the day, the company is focused on revenue. Every company is. Mm -hmm. And the CFO's number one edict is to is grow revenue. The CEO is grow revenue. We're all focused on that. And the reason companies invest in marketing is to grow revenue. 
But the reality is that when you go in and statistically analyze how media impacts revenue, a lot of marketing, a lot of media does not actually directly correlate to revenue. Think about it, the digital aspect of things, buying ads online to get people to come to your website, that, that doesn't increase your revenue, at least directly. And so there's revenue, there's money that you spend at the upper part of the funnel that drives people, that gets interest, that brings them to your website, but that doesn't lead to revenue. And when you go and statistically analyze these different types of media, such as the media that builds awareness at the top of the funnel, sometimes you realize that media doesn't actually lead to revenue. So if you were to analyze it just directly towards revenue, you would stop doing that. And that's what a lot of companies did is that they cut off the top of their funnel. And what you end up with is that when you stop spending money in awareness-driven media and branding, you end up with a smaller funnel, which means your reach is less, you're impacting fewer people, and your ad effectiveness overall goes down, your ROI goes down. So it's important to look at your funnel. And when I think about a traditional B2B journey, you've got obviously leads. Leads are what drive a B2B organization. But before leads, you've got sessions, people visiting your website. And then from sessions, those lead to like maybe email signups where people are requesting information. And then those lead to leads. And then you've got your different stages in your CRM as you follow through with folks. And then eventually that leads to a sale. And that's your, your conversion funnel. And your marketing dollars and your investment in media and PR impact different parts of that funnel. And it's important to recognize that. But it's also important to focus in on the fact of what's building the top of the funnel that keeps it flowing in because that makes everyone's job a lot easier. So you're suggesting that we really focus in on the top of the funnel as opposed to the bottom of the funnel, which a lot of companies do. I think, I just really remember the company that did, was it Airbnb that turned off the bottom of the funnel? And That's right. Focused well, in on branding? Yeah, totally. Because during the pandemic, they were like, hey, nobody's leaving their homes. We should stop our marketing. But they were smart enough to have looked back. Someone within the organization probably said, well, there's history on this. There's been times in, in, in the history in the last 50 years or 100 years where people have faced some sort of, some sort of, something bad has happened. And what's happened with brands? What we realize is that the brands that pulled back and stopped marketing, they lost market share and they never regained it. And the brands that came out and just put out messages that said, we're here for you. We're not going to abandon you. And we'll be here when everything gets better and we're here with you now. Those, band, those brands were able to grab market share. And the brands that lost it never re regained it 40, 50 years later. So someone inside of Airbnb, the light bulb went off and they went out and went on this whole branding campaign. And when they realized how well it worked for them, they have not gone back in that direct approach. They are just oh. continuing on the upper part of the funnel because it works so well, it pays off in spades. Of course, the problem is that in the world of Google Analytics and the world of digital marketing, it's much sexier to spend money closer to the sale, mm. to the revenue in the case like we're talking about, because then you can prove, hey, I did this and it did that. Look at the direct correlation, isn't that great? And that's why right now we're seeing this growth in what we call retail media. So now in the US, we have walmart.com. And so if you're any type of CPG category, it's not only are you on TV, you're doing your own direct to consumer campaigns, but as soon as somebody adds a competitive product to their shopping cart, you're buying an ad that says, hey, I'll give you a deal on this. Maybe you should switch that out for this. And it's kind of the equivalent of the end cap display, if you will, in the supermarket. And that's very sexy because it's, look, I did this and I got that. But the real question is, was it incremental? Meaning if you didn't do that, how many sales would you have actually gotten? You probably would have gotten the same amount. And that's part of the problem right now is that people want to get as close to that sale as possible. But branding has been proven to work over and over again. And it can be measured. I'm curious, would you say that the problem occurs and that people still struggle, businesses still struggle to create a holistic journey and be able to draw data 
that is pulled in from the different platforms and tools that they use into some sort of manageable and digestible format? Or is it just the fact that it's difficult to get data across platforms? It's difficult. If you go back 10 years ago, everything that big brands were doing in the digital space was through double-click ad server. And there was this great double-click ID that, that followed people around. And brands and a lot of the holding companies, the agencies had all of, all of these different methodologies where they could pull out that double click ID. And that's what we did at C3 Metrics is that someone could, a brand could run an ad on Facebook and we could actually measure it. We could get that impression because our tags were there. And a year later, if that individual showed up on a website, we could actually show the brand they showed up. So when you actually have all that deterministic information, it's big data, it's a lot of work, but it's fairly straightforward to build out a machine learning model to say, hey, spend more here. This actually worked. Even though it was nine months ago, you're going to get a lift. But now what's happened is the walls went up. Facebook doesn't allow you to individual impression data, no user level data. YouTube has put the walls up. There's no user level data coming out of any Google properties whatsoever. Same is true of TikTok, Snap, and whoever else comes up tomorrow, you're not going to be able to get it. So the minimum amount of data that you're going to be get, or I should say the maximum amount of data is you'll know how much you spent today. You'll know what creatives ran and you'll know how many impressions you received. Mm -hmm. But there's some platforms where you won't get clicks. So being able to get user level data that we used to be able to get, and it wasn't that long ago, it was only a couple of years ago. It's now impossible. It's just not mm -hmm. available anymore. So a lot of companies and a lot of agencies built up entire practices around building out these huge data warehouses. And now you can't do that. That's why what we're all hearing about now are clean rooms where, oh, you want to do some business with Walmart? Great. We're going to create a clean room with Walmart. You're going to sync all of your customer data. They'll give you IDs for those and you'll be able to target your customers on Walmart. But... You can't take that data anywhere else. Now, if you go to Disney, you can do the same thing, but you can't take that data anywhere else. Same thing with Amazon. So you're locked into their world because they want you to spend there. So you have no use. So again, you're stuck with no user level data. All you have as a brand right now is your first party data. You have how people came to your website and what they're doing on your website when they fill out forms and that's it. And from the platforms, all you have is how much you spent, how many impressions, and what creative ran, and what the different campaigns were. Mm. And that's it. That's all you have. So we're back to the days before digital. Because before digital, all we had was TV, print, and radio. And when someone walked into a store to buy something, unless they had a coupon, you had no way of knowing how they walked in. So then we step back and say, how did brands like Coke and Pepsi, how did they grow? How did all these car companies grow? Use techniques, they use probabilistic modeling techniques like marketing mix modeling to look at correlations between impressions that were in market and sales. And that's how they grew their businesses. And so now we're in a world where we have lots of different places to spend dollars, less information than we're used to dealing so we have to go back to the future, if you will, to figure this whole mess out. And could you elaborate on how your platform addresses the issue? Yeah, since I come from the background of multi-touch attribution, where I had all this user level data, and I started the company in 2008, I saw the excitement that marketers had, and I was able to see what they got excited about. And what they got excited about was the fact that, hey, this is always on, once you hook it up, all that data is there. And you're not just stuck with sales. We could do as many KPIs, key performance indicators. We could do leads. We could do all different levels, as many as we wanted to do. And then on the marketing mix side, which is where my data scientist comes from, because his work with PepsiCo and Coke, they were able to look at things like incrementality, meaning what was the actual how many sales would you have gotten if you hadn't actually done that, which is incredibly important in today's world. But also they weren't limited to digital. They could also look at things like out of home. They could look at TV. They could look at podcasts. They could look at anything that had impressions. And so marketing mix has historically been called top down because it was very high level. It was always at a 
channel level. Multi-touch attribution was always at a user level. And so with probolytics, we're in the middle. We call it, internally, we call it middle out. And we're mm -hmm. using very advanced machine learning and AI and to model through this data all simultaneously. So we're able to take in very limited data. How much did you spend? How many impressions? What were the creatives, the campaign, the ad groups? We're able to take that data in and we're able to push out granular level recommendations. And you see, that's the difference because with marketing mixed modeling, the only output was spend 10% more in direct mail, spend 5% less in digital. So if you're the search person or you're the Facebook person and your budget gets cut 5% and you say, where should I cut? So there's no insight, but with Provolytics, you get the direct insight as to where to increase and where to decrease to increase the numbers. And from a holistic aspect, which you talked about before, we're able to take all media into this. As long as there's an impression that can be measured, it can be incorporated into the model. So it's very exciting. And at its core, it's interesting because when I talk about back to the future, I'm not kidding. Because what most people don't know is that the basis of most of AI today is a technique that's been around since the 1700s. That's what's crazy about all this growth. There's a modeling technique called Bayesian. And Bayesian has been around since the 1700s. And the reason that it is exploding all of this AI is because it works very similar to how humans work and how we solve problems. And that allows it, humans, when we go to solve a problem, if we don't know how to figure out something, we guess at it and then we go and figure it out. And then if a couple minutes later, we have different insights, we make another guess and we always get closer to what the actual number is. And that's because our brain is able to update. And so Bayesian is constantly updating and just like the human brain. And that's what's driven most of the AI. And that's kind of the backbone for Provolytics and most of the AI that's out there today. Very interesting. With the different limitations that different platforms uh, allow for, how are you able to get around that? Everything from the lack of cooking and much more. How do you get around that? Is that more the AI side or something else? No, it's a great question. It's more of looking at the reality of today because cookies are on their way out. And mm -hmm. we all know about the iOS issues that everyone faces. And it's an interesting problem because if you go back before these issues came out, Facebook, if you had a thousand leads in a month, Facebook would say, hey, we got you 800 of those thousand. And if you were any type of B2B marketer, you're spending elsewhere and didn't get you 800 of the thousand. So you had an adjustment in mind. You'd probably cut it in half and said, okay, they got 400. And that's how you ran your business for a long time. When the iOS changes came out, all of a sudden Facebook, they went over the course of a several months, instead of being 800, they'd say 400. But most marketers were still cutting that number in half to 200. The reality is Facebook hasn't changed. The same folks that are using Facebook and Instagram, they're still there. But with the iOS changes, Facebook is unable to measure as well as they could before. They can't track across app. And so they are incredibly limited. And we're coming up now next year with what we're calling the cookie apocalypse, third party cookies, which has been how all the, all the entire internet has been based upon this concept of tracking. It, it's a game changer on one hand. On the other hand, in iOS, third party cookies have always been gone. They've been gone for years. And that's the little dirty little secret of marketing is that a lot of marketers have not been able to target iOS users for a long time. So a lot of agencies, mm -hmm. they just shifted to Android, but pretty soon all of that's gonna change. And in the US, we have something else going on, which is in every single state in the US, mm -hmm. there is a new privacy regulation that's coming out, that's being written. And so what that means for marketers is that the ability to capture this data and use it the way you used to is going to change dramatically. And so as a result, everyone is hampered. So it's really for us, when we built this technology, it was stepping back and looking ahead. What's coming up? We knew that regulation was coming. We saw what had happened in iOS. We knew that more 
tightening down was going to occur. We knew the walls were going to come up. So we said, well, we're only going to be able to have how much money I spent, what were the impressions, and what creative ran. We need to be able to solve for that without getting that user level data. And that's really the key is that we're in this new world where we have to go back to the way things used to be and use advanced probabilistic modeling and machine learning and AI to use statistical statistics to come up with the right answer or not the right answer. That's the reality with modeling is that models are all wrong. Let's just be honest. They're all wrong. Some are useful. And the key is that those that are willing to put their money where their mouth is and prove it. And when I say prove it is that if you're working with a model, you should be able to demonstrate the validity of that model. And the way you do that is by looking at, here's what the model said you would get if you spent this, and here's what you actually got. So if a model predicts what you should be getting next month, when next month comes, you should be able to go back and say, okay, here's what I spent, here's what the impressions were, I want you to hold back from the model what the sales were, what the leads were, whatever the KPIs were, and show me what you predicted and what the actual was. And that number should be something that you should say, oh, wow, yeah, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. If it's not impressive, then you need to reset and maybe look at another model. But if it was impressive enough where you said, wow, if I had known this, I, you know, I would have bought Tesla 10 years ago. So that's what you want in a model. You want something okay. that will tell you 10 years ago, Tesla would have been a good buy. Uh, so if I could put this in a different way or another way, you're basically using almost a form of experimentation to ensure that your tracking and measurement is up to scratch. So you're using a model or models to make this hypothesis, testing it out, and then overlapping the spacing model in order to ensure that it improves and gets you more to what is accurate or reality. Will that be? <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And then when we have the actuals, the actual, what we call in market activations, what you actually spent. Then we go back and then we show, this is what you actually spent. This is what we said you would get with what you actually spent. And here's how well we were able to predict. And that's really the key is, how effective is the model? How well is it able to look forward? It's the same thing with weather. How accurate is the weatherman, the weather person in terms of forecasting? And that's really what we're talking about. At the end of the day, Google Analytics is really great at telling you how you did yesterday. It shows you what happened. It may even show you in real time what's going on. But what marketers really need, especially in this new world where CFOs are tightening down on budgets, is they need something that can forecast and tell them, if you do this, you will get this. Right. I guess there, there's a number of implications, but one that comes to mind is the fact that if once you're able to get an accurate picture of what models, sorry, what channels are most effective, then you can almost try to bring this in-house and part of your organization. I'm thinking of, what was it, HubSpot, who are quite hustled in order to increase their reach and messaging. Is that a natural, I guess, byproduct of the benefits of using a platform like you and the insights that they gain from it? No, absolutely. Because the data that we push out, when I exited C3 Metrics in 2019, about 95% of our clients we're not even accessing our dashboard. And that's because all of their organizations had adopted their own dashboards internally. And so what we saw was this trend in 2008, organizations, they wanted a place to log in where they could see this data to be able to prove it out to their organizations. And then over the course of 10 to 12 years, most organizations built out their own internal dashboarding systems. And we all know the advantage of dashboards is that we can share this data internally and we can build consensus internally, which is incredibly important. And so when we built Provalytics, we were like, I, originally when we started doing POCs for clients, I, all of the data was accessible in an Excel spreadsheet. And I said to all of our initial partners, I said, listen, don't worry, we're building out dashboards, but I just want you to have it in this form. And the reality was, we didn't have dashboards, but I told them that. And every single client said to me, yeah, that's great about the dashboards, but I just want to make sure I still get it in Excel. 
And I was like, really? I'm like, why do you want that? Because this makes it easier for me to share. And I can just upload this in our internal dashboarding systems because we have, once it's, once we have it as like a CSV or an Excel file, I can just upload it, pivot, and then whatever reporting I want to show can be shared across the entire org. And I was like, wow. And there's something about analytics, especially marketing analytics. It's very intimidating for folks. And I'll be the first to admit Google Analytics is just overwhelming to me. There's so much stuff going on because I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Urchin was around. A lot of folks don't know that Google acquired a company called Urchin. Urchin was this great web analytics company. And here's a little insight. Everyone knows, well, like UTM source, UTM medium. UTM stands for Urchin Tracking Module. So this is what's funny is they bought the company and they still kept the UTM from before. But it was so easy to use, but over the years, it's become so complicated. And marketing analytics is a bit overwhelming for folks across organizations. But there's something about when you hand someone all of their data and all of the results in an Excel file, it's so accessible. If I have a question about a formula, I can click on it. I can see everything I need to see right there. So that's the way you build consensus in an organization. But for me, what I see is that most orgs have their own internal dashboarding systems. And the way to bring it in-house is to push out the data in a format that can be easily absorbed. So it's interesting that you say that people are looking for the ability to access it via an Excel sheet. Buying is certainly important. Is there an element of resistance that you find in organizations in terms of using the approach that you take in order to drive data and to speak to this idea of growth right now? Is everybody wants it right now? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of resistance because everyone is concerned that what happens if the new guy comes in and what the new guy or the new girl has to show mm. says that the stuff that I'm focused on is wrong. Mm. And that's the problem in an organization is that, and most people inside organizations, they know it, they know that half the time they're there, they're focused on their job building the organization. And the other half the time, they're focused on making certain that they're safe within the organization. And everyone has their pet projects. And there's always a concern when new measurement comes in. It's like the sheriff came into town. And the sheriff comes in and says, hey, this one thing that you've been doing hasn't been working. And I remember in the early days of attribution back in like 2010, we would come in to a big brand and the brand would say to their partners, their publishers, they'd say, hey, we're bringing in C3 metrics and they're going to do an attribution study. And all the brands would say, oh, that's great. That's great. We love C3. We've worked with them. And then as soon as the first read came in, the initial insights, whoever didn't look good on the scorecard. They all of a sudden they would say, oh, they're no good. We have a better data scientist. And then the battles would begin. And there's always battles. I used to always say that attribution is one of these things that the way to really start it is you would come on site and you would do a half day workshop and you'd have to, you'd have to make sure that your workshop would be in a corner office so they could look outside because on the front lawn, you would have someone digging up the lawn, preparing for a fire walk. And you would end the half day conference with taking them outside and showing them that it's safe to walk across hot coals, like how Tony Robbins does the fire walk. Cause that's what, that's what measurement is like. It's mm -hmm. like walking across hot coals because what you find out is the stuff that you thought was working, like the lower funnel stuff. Yeah, on paper, it looks like it's working, but the reality is that it's actually not driving new business. It's the stuff that doesn't look good sometimes that is actually driving business. The stuff that there's no evidence to it. And that's the problem, is that it's tough. It's a tough pill to take. And, it, and to be honest, it's tough to sell in, but it's, that's what's sexy about it. That's what's exciting because it's a challenge and when people are able to absorb it and see it, that's where we see incredible growth.
And that's what's exciting. Would you say that a lot of this could be addressed from the get-go if you had the right culture in the organization that wasn't concerned about looking good, but rather on the overall objective of the organization and how we get there was irrelevant, but the fact that we were failing forward and moving forward, so to speak. No, a thousand percent. Having the right culture makes all the difference, but we have to always remember is that even with the right culture, it's only as strong as the weakest link Mm -hmm. in the organization. So there's always individuals that are involved and we always have to address those, but having that right culture where we're focused on moving the needle ahead, being, as you said earlier, purpose-driven, focused on our ideals, focused on what our purpose is, that makes all of the difference without a doubt. And this all is having as well, having the C-suite. The C-suite has to be involved in any type of cultural shift within an organization. And that's why most of our engagements, they start at the C-level because without their involvement, having a shift in measurement from like a Google Analytics to a more statistical approach, it's not going to work. So we need to have them invested as well. Absolutely. Which would suggest to me that with this idea of culture, and we talked about branding earlier on, and with all the data that we're getting, we should really, as part of this whole idea of creating the right culture, craft narratives that reinforce the culture and the outcomes of the overall mission and purpose of the organization, which to my mind also brings up this idea that numbers are great in that they speak to how we're making progress, but behind those numbers are people. And we should be able to craft a narrative around the journey that these people take and the impact that's, that we're enabled, that we're enabling them to create within their lives. No, uh, yeah, no, a thousand percent. There, there's incredible shifts that are going on in the workplace today. When you think about in the UK, all the work that they've done with the four day work week and mm-hmm. the research that has come out recently that shows the lift in employee engagement, the lift in sales. It's just absolutely incredible. So I I think that there's a lot of work that can be done culturally within an organization that moves everyone forward. And that makes all the difference across the world, especially from a measurement perspective, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. This has been a fascinating conversation, Jeff. I'm curious though, are there a couple of aspects to this whole idea of future-proofing your ad measurement? that perhaps doesn't get much airtime? If so, what would they be? Yeah, the whole idea behind future-proofing is that Mm -hmm. adopting a new measurement platform is not something you can say, hey, let's change the way we measure in an organization. It it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And it can literally, in larger organizations, it can take several years. And what's horrible is when you all go in on a type of measurement and you're in on it, you've had a good run with it for a year or two, it's been adopted internally, and now it stops working. That's bad Mm -hmm. because now you have to shift again. And whoever was behind that is not looking good internally. And so we really have to think about how do you future-proof? That's that's a crazy term. Everybody wants to future-proof everything. It comes down with just saying, okay, The world has changed in terms of measurement. No one imagined that the walls would go up as much as they did. No one imagined that we would have limited information. And who could have ever imagined that browsers would change the way that you could get information, that the whole basis of the internet, which is third-party cookies, would go away. That's just the cookie apocalypse. Five years ago, we would have said, there's just no way it's going to happen. But it's happening. So we have to step back and say, what's the... What are we going to have moving forward? If I spend money, I know how much money I spent. I know the day I spent it. And I know how many impressions I got because that's the minimum I'm going to be able to get from any platform. And so we need to be able to have measurement that can work under those constraints. And that's the basis from which that we built Provolytics. Because I've been in this space long enough and my team has been in this space long enough to see that as soon as we think we have something figured out, all of a sudden there's a new shiny object that marketers are all in on. When Snapchat came out, everybody was all in on it. And so every year or so, there's something new 
And there's always limitations there. So we've built out this platform to ensure that whatever the limitations are, we're gonna be able to measure it. And that's the important thing. Absolutely. To wrap things up, Jeff, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your top takeaway? Top takeaway is that the world of measurement and the world of marketing is always changing and you have to be prepared and you need to make certain that you can measure it in such a way so that whatever you adopt internally, you can keep that level of measurement. Because look at us now, the world of Google Analytics, we all thought we were all in on it. And now they're pulling the carpet out from underneath us. We all have to switch to GA4 and it's completely different. So if we're going to switch to GA4, we might as well switch to something that will include podcasts, TV, CTV, even events, even direct mail. And no matter what, whatever else comes out next, we'll be able to measure that as well, too. That, that to me, would be the big takeaway. Point. And if listeners are curious, wanted to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? I would say go to provalytics.com. That's P-R-O-V-A, Lytics. Dot com. That's the best place to get information. If they want to reach out, just click on the contact us or the demo form and happy to connect and uh, looking forward to having conversations with anyone about this. Brilliant. And we'll include a link to that in the show notes. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. Much, much appreciated. My pleasure. I had a wonderful time and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation as well.